Welcome to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. I'm your host, Mark Gunn. The views expressed on this program are those of the host and guests and not necessarily reflective of anyone or any entity associated with this broadcast. This episode, Critical Race Theory and America's Critical Condition. When it comes to the issue of race, America has always had a problem looking itself in the mirror when it comes to its own racist history. It's a reflection they simply do not want to see. The problem of racism is the problem of white people. It's created by white people, it's perpetuated by white people, it benefits white people. We don't even know what being white is or how we came to be white. Like, we understand so little um, because we aren't meant to understand. That's how the system perpetuates itself because. It exists in silence, it's wrapped in silence, and we learn not to question it. Racism is in the very DNA of this country. Here's how it works. You might think racism in the U.S. is really a case of a few bad apples. A racist cop here, a so-called Karen there, a leader of a white supremacist group. You know, people who deliberately hate. But we can't blame racism in America on just a few bad apples. Think of our nation's problem as more like an apple pie with the racial injustice baked right into every aspect of our society. (laughs) Meet Ebony and Emily, two American babies, one black, one white, born at the same time, same place. But Ebony will not get an equal slice of the pie. And that starts from birth. Because of her race, Ebony is three times more likely than Emily to die in the hospital as a newborn if her doctor is white. And once Ebony and Emily go to school, while both girls occasionally misbehave, studies show they won't face the same punishment. Ebony is seven times more likely than Emily to be suspended and four times more likely to be arrested on campus. When the two girls grow up and apply for jobs, odds are fewer employers will call Ebony back because she has a black sounding name. And even though Emily and Ebony will get the same college degree, once Ebony is hired statistically as a black person, she'll make an average of 25% less than Emily. So why didn't Ebony get an equal slice of that apple pie? It's because systemic racism is built into our country's DNA. In the 17th and 18th centuries, wealthy white men needed land, so they took it from indigenous people and then forced blacks into slavery. To justify using blacks for free labor, the whites in power promoted a myth that blacks were inferior. And as Seattle-based author Ijoma Oluo points out, our nation's institutions, politics, and policies were designed against the backdrop of that money-driven lie that black people just weren't as worthy or as capable as whites. Our school systems were built around this. Our economic systems are built around this. Our government systems were built around this. And it is simply that things were designed to uphold this story, to uphold this exploitation. And even though slavery ended here more than 150 years ago, the racism that fueled it persists in systemic ways today. White Americans now hold 85% of this country's wealth. Black Americans, just over 4%, and Hispanics, just over 3%. People of color, people like Ebony, are statistically more likely to be impoverished, incarcerated, and face discrimination in healthcare. Emily may have her own barriers in life, but her skin color won't be one of them. It's not someone said, here's your wealth because you're white. Here's your status because you're white. It simply means that the barriers that we placed in front of people of color were not placed in front of you. Now, you may have a whole nother set of barriers, right? You may have barriers of disability, barriers of class, barriers of immigration status, so many other barriers that were placed in front of you. But Acknowledging privilege is simply acknowledging if we also took that other set of barriers that we place in front of people of color, you would stumble even further. So even though you may not consider yourself a bad apple, a racist cop, a so-called Karen, or a member of an extremist group, Aluo says you may have played a role, 
even if you have the best intentions. Instead of this whole, let's all learn to be best friends and love each other, you can love someone of a different race and ethnicity and still actively participate in their oppression based on how you vote, based on what you bring up in your office meetings, you know, based on where you spend your money. It's not too late to change the recipe of the most American apple pie. The biggest problem is that quite a few of them believe that, despite centuries of evidence, racism in America simply does not exist. Former Attorney General Eric Holder explained it brilliantly in 2009 when he called America a nation of cowards. One cannot truly understand America without understanding the historical experience of black people in this nation. Simply put, to get to the heart of this country, one must examine its racial soul. Though this nation has proudly thought of itself as a ethnic melting pot, in things racial, we have always been, and we, I believe, continue to be, in too many ways, essentially a nation of cowards. Though race-related issues continue to occupy a significant portion of our political discussion, and though there remain many unresolved racial issues in this nation, we, average Americans, simply do not talk enough with each other about things racial. It is an issue that we have never been at ease with, and given our nation's history, this is in some ways understandable. And yet, if we are to make progress in this area, we must feel comfortable enough with one another and tolerant enough of each other to have frank conversations about the racial matters that continue to divide us. But we must do more. And we in this room bear a special responsibility through its work and through its example. The Department of Justice, this Department of Justice, as long as I am here, must and will lead the nation to the new birth of freedom so long ago promised by our greatest president. This is our duty. This is our solemn responsibility. We commemorated five years ago the 50th anniversary of the landmark Brown versus the Board of Education decision. And though the world that we now live in is fundamentally different than that which existed then, this station has still not come to grips with its racial past, nor has it been willing to contemplate in a truly meaningful way the diverse future it is fated to have. To our detriment, this is typical of the way in which this nation deals with issues of race. And so I would suggest that we use February of every year to not only commemorate black history, but also to foster a period of dialogue between the races. Our history has demonstrated that the vast majority of Americans are uncomfortable with and would like to not have to deal with racial matters, and that is why those of us, black or white, elected or self-appointed, who promise relief and easy, quick solutions, no matter how divisive, people like that are too often embraced. We are then free to retreat to our race-protected cocoons where much is comfortable and where progress is not really made. If we allow this attitude to persist in the face of the most significant demographic changes that this nation has ever faced, and remember, there will be no majority race in the United States in about 50 years, the coming diversity that could be such a powerful, positive force will instead become a reason for stagnation and polarization. And though there is a crying need for all of us to know and to acknowledge the contributions of black Americans, a Black History Month is still a testament to the problem that has afflicted African Americans throughout our stay in this country. Black history is given a separate and unequal treatment by our society in general and by our educational institutions in particular. As a former American history major, I'm struck by the fact that such a major part of our national story has been divorced from the whole. In law, culture, science, athletics, industry, and other fields, knowledge of the roles played by blacks is critical to an understanding of the American experiment. Just like clockwork, Holder was accused of being a race baiter and that he was stirring the pot. In fact, that's pretty much the reaction to anyone who dares to even bring up the topic. I've been accused of it quite a few times myself. The other argument you often hear is that talking about race keeps up the division. Or one of my favorites, we get accused of, quote, playing the race card. Freshly baked organic spelt, 1095.
organic full cream milk, five dollars. Fair trade dark chocolate, seven dollars. A cheeky grape, free. Uh, uh, excuse me, I was here first. No, I was here first. Race card, priceless. Introducing the race card platinum. Race card platinum. Everybody's equal, but some more equal than others. Ever since slavery ended, blacks in this country have been in a constant fight to gain true equality, and those efforts have been systematically stifled at every turn. Education continues to be at the very heart of what I call the great white lie. As they say, history is written by the victors, and the United States of America has been the victor quite a lot. For this reason, they've gotten to write most of their own history, and it tends to be quite positive and rather rosy, and full of little vignettes that make particular groups' pet theories look rather grand. However, the truth is that when victors write the history, they often leave out the unpleasant details and even insert little bits of propaganda. We're going to go over the truth of America. American history. The Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, and that was that. As far as many Americans are concerned, the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, and the sweet sound of freedom rang out across the land, and all was well, you know, until those pesky Jim Crow laws came about. However, after the Emancipation Proclamation and before Jim Crow really got going, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which officially outlawed slavery and freed the remaining people held in bondage, except those who had committed felonies and were slaves of the state, whose labor the state could sell as it wished. The Emancipation Proclamation only freed the slaves who were in states in open rebellion, which didn't even include every major slaveholding state, and overall accounted for only about three quarters of the slaves in the country. While it was a big move, it was also only a presidential move that Lincoln could use because of the war, and it did not outlaw slavery or free all of the slaves. That would come later after the North beat the South soundly into the ground. According to what kids learn in this country, our history didn't begin until 1619, when the first kidnapped slaves landed in Virginia. And throughout time, our inventions, achievements, and contributions have been whitewashed, and our kids have been the victims of the most successful act of brainwashing ever devised. In fact, at this very moment, politicians are engaged in a concerted effort to not only continue the great white lie, but to limit what can be taught about this country's racist history. Tennessee Republican State Representative Justin Lafferty is facing some pretty intense backlash after defending what's widely viewed as uh, one of the most racist deals in U.S. history. I've heard referenced in here, as you all have, uh, the three-fifths compromise that was made long ago. Uh, quick question for all of you. Pull out a piece of paper, write down why that compromise was reached. The three-fifths compromise was a direct effort to ensure that southern states never got the population necessary to continue the practice of slavery everywhere else in the country. By limiting the number of population in the count, they specifically limited the number of representatives that would be available in the slaveholding states, and they did it for the purpose of ending slavery well before Abraham Lincoln, well before a civil war. That's not right. Uh, there's a quick history lesson for you here. Three-fifths compromise, 1787. Compromise agreed that for the purposes of representation, taxation, only three-fifths of a state's enslaved people would be counted toward its total population. It was called a compromise because there was this philosophical disagreement over slavery as the Constitution of the United States was being drafted. Slaveholding states wanted to exploit their slave population and gain as much influence in the new Congress as possible. And states that did not own slaves, uh, they argued that the enslaved population should not be fully counted because they feared such representation would make the South too powerful. Now, the compromise eventually landed on counting three-fifths of the enslaved population. However, as time goes on and there's greater access to information, more black people have been recognizing the great white lie for what it is and have been waking up from their red, white, and blue-induced slumber. We no longer depend on the school system to learn our true history. We're getting to a point to where we're no longer dependent on white-owned media to tell our stories either. We're fighting racism in ways that, quite frankly, scare a lot of white people, and that's where this latest debate comes in. Critical race theory, or CRT, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, is an intellectual movement and loosely organized framework of legal analysis based on the premise that race is not a natural, biologically grounded feature of physically distinct subgroups of human beings, but a socially constructed, culturally invented category that is used to oppress and exploit people of color. 
Critical race theorists hold that the law and legal institutions in the United States are inherently racist in as far as they function to create and maintain social, economic, and political inequities between whites and non-whites, especially African Americans. Dr. Imani Perry, professor of African American studies at Princeton University, explains. The most straightforward way to explain critical race theory is to begin with the civil rights movement, right? So the victories of the movement, which we all know, are found in federal legislation, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, but also in anti-discrimination law, essentially laws that declared Jim Crow policies unconstitutional. So after that moment, we begin to understand, uh, of course, that black people suffered many other forms of injury and had many systems of, of disadvantagement um, uh, and inequality in their lives, right? And so legislatures and municipalities and organizations began to make specific efforts to target African Americans with programs to address current and past discrimination. And they faced a major conservative backlash. And the way that backlash was was formed with saying, well, if you make programs to target the discrimination experienced by black Americans and you don't include me, white person, then you are discriminating against me, right? And so they begin to attack programs like affirmative action and upward bound, et cetera. And the, the Supreme Court of the United States then really fails the civil rights movement by basically treating targeted programs to address racial inequality as the same form of discrimination as Jim Crow laws, right? That they all both are subject to immediate scrutiny, uh, the strictest scrutiny. So, okay, so we get to this point and then civil rights lawyers and scholars begin to talk about how we have to be able to address subordination, injustice, not just color consciousness. It's not enough to be colorblind. We actually have to be able to address injustice and subordination if we're going to have legal racial equality. And that's the heart of critical race theory how to think about law, legislation, policies that will substantively respond to racial inequality. And they began to bring multiple forms of analysis to the table, history, narrative, um, gender, uh, class, showing all the insidious ways that discrimination and inequality have been sedimented in American society, right? And then it blooms in multiple directions, but it is literally just a way of understanding the mechanics of racial inequality and how the law might be imagined to address them. Nothing more than that. Professor Derek Bell has been credited with coming up with the concept of critical race theory. He says that even though we all know what racism is, there are some aspects that we have all wrong. One of the things I think is that we have mischaracterized it. We have misdiagnosed it, if you will. For years and years, we thought that racism was an aberration a defect on the American scene, one that was a holdover from slavery, one that we had the tools to correct through law, and one that there was a desire to correct. Um, and it's taken us a long time to recognize that that was a wrong diagnosis, that uh, racism is an important stabilizing uh, function, serves as a stabilizing function in a society that is built on property. And in a society where a great many whites don't have any property to speak of, certainly don't have as much as those on the top, what the society has given them from the time of slavery to the present is a sense of property in their whiteness, that their skin color enables them to somehow identify uh, and live vicariously the lives of those on the top as also through the soap operas and the tabloids and the, and the hopes through the uh, lotteries, and to feel superior to blacks who, whatever their status, are deemed on, on the bottom. And the pushback from a lot of white Americans was not surprising. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school, does not mean that I'm a racist, damn it. Some frustrated parents say their children are being taught to feel bad about being white because of the school's adoption of a concept called critical race theory. However, Rockwood administrators say that is not part of their curriculum. It's really what we're trying to do in curriculum is just present various perspectives. We're not saying that we support one or the other. We're just trying to 
um, engage in conversation about how different people think and how different people may see things. Local lawmakers at the event talked about a Missouri bill to essentially ban identifying race, gender, and other groups in school lessons. The event's organizer, who doesn't have kids in the district anymore, he hopes administrators were watching. Educate people on what you're trying to teach, not, and if, if the, you know, the majority objects to that, then, then don't teach that. A lot of educators are at odds with their state governments when it comes to the importance of teaching the truth when it comes to American history. There is white fear that the teaching of CRT will expose this country as the fraud we've always known her to be. Well, history is dangerous because it goes after our myths and our identity. And when someone challenges those myths and identities, the reaction can be ferocious. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing now. Uh, but for me, uh, who grew up as a white Southerner infused with what I call the lost cause myth, which is that the, 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 the war, the Civil War wasn't about slavery, that Lee was the greatest human, that Reconstruction was a failure, that enslaved people were happy. Well, these are monstrous lies that, that formed a, a uh, violent white uh, racist society in the South. The South of my birth was a racial police state. And I realized that I couldn't convince people that there was another story here unless I used my own story to do that. And in fact, I kept running into problems to be able to, to convince people that just that the Civil War was about slavery. And I was more successful when I made myself vulnerable and said, hey, I grew up with these lies too. But these lies infect American history. They infect our society. And, and the only way that we can uh, get uh, past this, the only way that we can confront uh, and have a better future is to acknowledge and understand our racist past. Other countries have a much better handle on dealing with their past than the so-called greatest nation on earth. While America celebrates its racists and traitors with Confederate monuments and statues, have you ever wondered why Germany, the country responsible for the wholesale slaughter of millions of Jews, goes out of its way to ban symbols of its Nazi past? Why do they take great care in teaching their children their complete history? South Africa, after apartheid, even set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Why are these countries so committed to the truth while America continues to embrace the great white lie? Dr. Jane Elliott has an answer. Number one, the effects on people who look like me are to cause them tremendous fear because they know that within 30 years, and now it's about down to 20 years, we melanemic people will be a numerical minority in the United States of America. That's the way it is. And incidentally, this is not America. America is everything from the northernmost point of Canada to the southernmost point of South America, and we, in our arrogance, call it America, as if the 48 contiguous states, Alaska, Hawaii, Hawaii, and the islands off the southeastern coast of the United States are all that constitutes America. We've got to change our vocabulary. I'm an educator. Educators are engaged in the business of leading people out of ignorance. The Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, that whole group of mostly white, fairly young men, most of them are old enough to know better, but too damn young to care. And you cannot solve things by saying to people, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with facts. And that's exactly what most of us are doing most of the time in this country right now. We want to pretend that what we have is what we have described. It isn't this country, which is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people that when people of color get power, they're going to want to treat us the way we have treated them. That is the major problem in the United States right now is white fear of, be of retribution. I think we could give up that fear. I have watched people go through this exercise, the blue eyed brown eyed ex exercise, and after it's over, I have heard them say, I had no idea. I will not abuse people. I will not make them feel the way I felt when I was on the bottom. I never knew how it felt to be on the bottom before. Now I've found out how that feels. I will never do something that will make someone feel the way I felt for just an hour and a half. I think we have misjudged the intelligence and the humanity of a whole lot of people of color, and that's why we're afraid of them. The other fear in teaching critical race theory is that we as black people are finally correcting the mistake of letting others control the narrative when it comes to our history. It is credibly threatening to white people to have well, history sure, sure. reframed not on their terms. Sure. It's an acknowledgement that this country was built a large part by the backs of our ancestors. I believe that we make the mistake in allowing white folks to basically to sever American history. Mm -hmm. The mistake in severing American history from 1619 to 1863 is they then say, okay, okay, then you have the 12 years of reconstruction and then you have 1877 with the Great Compromise of 1876. The problem with that, the problem with Great Compromise of 1877, the problem with, with the severing is 
they don't want to admit that was a continuation. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, Jim Crow follows slavery, yeah. even with the years of Reconstruction. That's right. So I don't sever it. And so you have to me, you have to link, you have to link the blackface because same thing with the un with, with the unfurling of the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. Okay, that thing was out of American society for at least two generations. Mm -hmm. But when the Democrats chose to put civil rights in their plank in 1948, that's when the white Dixiecrats lost their mind, had their convention in Mississippi in 1948, mm -hmm. and re introduce the flag, the Confederate flag, to this country. So all the people who are running around with the Confederate flag, that ain't from the Civil War, all this honoring our ancestors, no, yeah. it's from 1948. So all those things have to be tied together, and you also have to tie Angela Davis in together because the anger at the Black Freedom Movement, the mm -hmm. anger at uh, Black Panthers, the anger, all those sort of things, they all go together, and so they all are part of this continuum. And see, as long as we allow them to, to own the narrative, mm -hmm. yes. to establish the narrative and set the parameters of the conversation, that's what it's like, oh no, that was so long ago. It's like, no, it wasn't. Because yeah, see, that was last week. Critical race theory is yet another opportunity to take another few steps in reconciling its racist past. It can't be avoided because even if it's not taught in the school system, people will find ways of getting the information. Think about it. As black people like me learn more of the truth about this country and our history as enslaved Africans, you're seeing more of a hostile and less patriotic attitude toward the United States. It's because of its continued embrace of the delusion that this is the shining city on the hill and the continued denial of its ongoing atrocities. I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it. America's whiteness will be the cause of its self-destruction. White men have already been deemed as its greatest threat. You can either learn the truth or suffer the critical consequences. The choice may no longer be yours. You've been listening to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. The views expressed are those of the host and guests and not reflective of any business entity or anyone associated with this broadcast. If you have any comments or want more information on how to be a sponsor, log on to our website at markgunmedia.com or call us at 502-407-0283. That's 502-407-0283. Thank you for listening. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla. Just damn good work. Just damn good work.